Hey y'all, how's it going? Welcome back to Seed to Plate channel. Today I want to sit down and do a video with you guys. It is very hot outside, so we're doing another inside video. And that's because I wanted to talk you and walk you through my process of how I um, plan out, start seeds, plant, and appropriately plant out about 320 square feet of garden space with a full-time job. So if this is your first time here, hi, my name is Brooke. Um, this is Seed to Play channel. I am an urban suburban gardener and I just really love gardening and I needed an outlet. So I do work full-time at a tech company. Um, so I have to be really smart and strategic about my time and how I garden. My garden goals are very ambitious, but that doesn't mean I have to sacrifice my dreams and my goals. It just means I need to plan and organize and think ahead a little bit smarter um, than maybe somebody who doesn't have a full-time job. I think when I first got started gardening and watching YouTube gardeners and all this stuff, um, I had to really remind myself that like these gardens are so big and beautiful and lush because these people have just a lot more time to dedicate to their gardens than I do. Um, so I've kind of figured out a way to be more proactive, sit down, spend a couple of hours strategically thinking about my garden and going from there. So. First thing I think about are my different gardens. So I have two different gardens. I have a 200 square foot, uh, so it's 20 foot by 10 foot community garden plot. And then I have various sizes of beds in my backyard and some grow bags. So the first thing I do is I actually, this is gonna look hectic when I show it to you, but I actually draw out the spaces. So I draw out the community plot, all the beds in the back, and I lay it out. Once I've drawn out my spaces, I actually think about the light. So my community plot has unfiltered, straight up sunlight for eight to 12 hours a day. It is just, it gets nailed, um, which is a good thing. But my backyard, um, because of some trees that we have, um, they're not our trees, they're our back neighbor's trees. Um, but because we're in a neighborhood, there's fences, there's trees, it's not like this completely unobscured space. The backyard goes from getting a solid eight hours of sun during the summer to probably like five to six hours of sun in the fall and winter. It gets really bad in the winter, um, but wanna take advantage of the transition time for fall. So with all of that in mind, I think about the amount of light and I kind of categorize the things that need more light with the things that can tolerate a little less light. So. Your things that are going to tolerate a little less light are going to be like lettuces, um, greens, maybe some root vegetables. Um, so just kind of keeping that in mind as well. Obviously, not everybody's going to have multiple garden spaces. That's a little bit unique for me. But definitely thinking about the light is incredibly important. So after I think about the light, <laughs> so the space and the light, I kind of know where the different plants are gonna go, mostly based on the light for me. If that's not really a factor for you, then I would really encourage you, if you're like a cereal seed collector like I am, to really sit down and ask yourself, what did we eat last year? What did we not have enough of? What did we have too much of? I'm still trying to really optimize my gardening in general. <laughs> like this year, I went overboard on the peppers. Like we do not eat as many jalapenos as I grew this year. Um, so that's just a way for me to kind of optimize that for next year. So what I realized last year is we eat a ton of green beans. Um, we don't eat as much like cauliflower or cabbage. So I'm not growing cauliflower or cabbage last year. I didn't grow it. I didn't grow it last year. Um, but just stuff like that, it's like, we just don't eat that stuff. So I think I've really honed in this year on what we like to eat and what we will eat and what's gonna grow well. So after I pick all my varieties, <laughs> which I will go through the varieties here in a minute, 
but after I pick all of the varieties, I like to start my own seeds. Um, some people don't, and that's totally cool. Um, if you don't like to start your own seeds, it is a bit of a process, but it's a process that I enjoy. If you don't like to start your own seeds, I would still encourage you to think about what kind of things you actually like to eat, and then go ahead and write it down on your calendar what day you're gonna go purchase those plants. Usually, you know, your big box nurseries and stuff will have that stuff out here in Texas, usually around September 1st, like Labor Day. So just a note there, you don't have to start seeds, but this is how I do it. So I take all of my varieties that I want to grow. I write down on my plan where they're going to go. So for example, at my community plot, we're gonna do a whole lot of broccoli and then some collards and then a lot of this stuff where you see DC next to, that means direct seed or direct sow. So I literally take my calendar, which that's the only reason I'm any, any semblance of organized in life is because I have a planner. Um, I would not be able to do as much as I do uh, every day without it. But I literally write down in my planning art like months in advance. Like I know that I cannot start any of my direct sow stuff until it's under 80 to 85 degrees consistently, which usually happens around like October 1st-ish. So I just wrote in my calendar the first weekend of October, I'm going to direct sow all of my root vegetables and kind of go from there. So that is how I do things. So with that being said, we're gonna go through each garden. I'm gonna show you the varieties that I am growing and also give you a timeline on how I will be, in theory, how I will be executing all of this. So. First things first, the community garden plot. That plot is a 10 foot by 20 foot space. So it's 200 square feet. Um, it's, my, it's my biggest chunk of garden for sure. Um, so we will be growing Altham 29 broccoli. So I grew this last year. It performed really, really well for me. Um, the only problem is we weren't, we were gone the whole month of December last year, so we didn't actually get to eat any of it. Um, we got to eat some of it, but, but, but by the time we got back, a lot of it had already like gone to flower and all this stuff. So we really love broccoli. So I'm trying to put a little more investment into the broccoli this year. Um, I could have had more broccoli, but I tried to go Brussels sprouts and honestly, I need a break from Brussels sprouts. It's been a failure for me two years in a row. So I calculated the amount of room we're going to need is 10 feet, probably by about, I would call it like four feet of room. I don't want it to take up exactly half and I have to account for space between the rows, but we're going to end up with about 40 broccoli plants just in this garden space. So the other things that we're going to grow are collards. My collards didn't do that well last year. I think they just got choked out um, and they got aphids like really bad and I didn't do a very good job of like addressing that issue. Um, so two different types of collards um, in the community plot, Alabama blue and green glaze. Now the reason I am putting the collard greens in the community plot is because um, you can pick them a couple times a week. They don't really have to be picked every day. Whereas some of the other stuff that I'm putting in the backyard garden is stuff that needs to be picked like every day. So the collards are also gonna be in there. And then the other things that are going to be in the other half of the fall garden, the way I planned it is the half that the broccoli and collards are going to be in is where all the peppers are currently. So the peppers will be done. We'll get all that ripped out. And um, probably sooner rather than later, honestly, the heat of the summer is really going to come up. And I'm actually going to plant black eyed peas to kind of like fix some of the nitrogen in the soil. Um, so all of that will come out. And that's where all of my broccoli and all of those transplants will go. Currently, the other half of the plot, it has pumpkins and melons. So the pumpkins won't get pulled until probably October. And that's when I'll come in, pull all of that out and um, direct sow my carrots, radishes, 
beets and then I will have to have transplants for both blue curled scotch kale and some ruby red chard. Um, I'll have those two, a couple rows of those. Um, but that'll all be direct seed and it'll all be a little like later in the season. So that's the plan for the other half of the plot to kind of like keep it transitioning. Um, because that's the other thing, right? You have to think about what you currently have in there is what you currently have in there. Is that going to last through your season? It's kind of a big juggling mess. So that takes care of the plot. The varieties that I will be growing in that second half of the plot, this half of the plot, which is where the broccoli and the collards will go. And then this half of the plot, which is where the pumpkins are currently, which is where all of this direct seeded stuff will go along with the blue curled scotch kale and the ruby red chard. So that is what the plot will hopefully look like. So the stuff that I am direct seeding in the other half of the plot where the pumpkins currently are at will be um, carrots. So I'm going to do just some really easy traditional carrot varieties. I'm doing tender sweet and then there is Danvers carrots and Scarlet Nance carrots. Um, so these are just like your standard orange carrot. It's nothing crazy. Um, that will be going in there. And then the other things that I'll be growing in that half of the plot are these pink beauty radishes. I got these seeds in a seed swap. And then uh, French breakfast and cherry bell radishes. So those will all go in that half as well. Um, I already said the blue curled scotch kale and the ruby red chard. Um, and then the other thing that will be going in there are my golden beets and my early wonder tall top beet. So that is what will be going in to the community plot direct seeded. So moving into the backyard garden, and also, sorry, my handwriting is terrible in here, but um, there is, there are three beds, two eight by fours, one four by four in the middle. The one that's closest to our back fence gets the least amount of sun in the dead of winter. So I have to really like strategize that and think about that um, just because of the way that the sun moves. So in the back bed, which is 32 square feet, we will have rainbow carrots and then we will also have Chantenay red core carrots and then we will be direct seeding some purple kohlrabi and some American purple top rutabagas. So all of that will get direct seeded um, probably around October. Um, I don't know that I'm gonna put anything in there from when the okra is done till October. It might just be empty, um, but we'll see. So then the middle bed that's four foot, four foot by four foot, that has pumpkins in it currently. So that's another one that I really can't plant out until October. That one will have Bloomsdale spinach which I grew this in the spring and it's awesome. I'm super excited to grow it again. I actually got more uh, seed. And then I will be growing some type of lettuce. I have a lot of different types of lettuces. Um, so it will be some type of lettuce. And my goal is to grow them as like head lettuces, um, but we'll see how that goes. So I have Iceberg, Black Seeded Simpson, Ruby Red, Rouge de Ver, uh, Butter Crunch, Little Gem, and like kind of just a medley. So we'll see how the whole lettuce thing goes. Last year my lettuce didn't do very well because I planted it way too early and it was just like hot. And so the lettuce was bitter. Um, fun fact, the hotter it is outside, the more bitter your greens are gonna be. Gross. So that's why kale, um, and collards and these like dark leafy greens and more tender lettuces. That's actually stuff you want to grow when it's kind of cold out. Um, so for us in the south, that is usually like cold. Um, that's usually October through like March is your like prime lettuce and greens growing season. So that's what will be in the middle bed. And then the front bed, which is closest to our house, that will have all of our beans. So 
we love green beans. Uh, they store really well, they freeze really well, and I don't know, for me, they're just fun and very satisfying to grow. This year we will be growing bush beans as well as pole beans, pole beans um, trellis, so they grab onto things and climb, and um, bush beans are just a bush that you pick off of. So the types of green beans that we'll be growing are, I'm gonna finish out these Blue Lake bush beans these are pretty great. These are a good like starter variety for sure. Um, Burpee stringless, we'll be also growing these. Another good starter variety, beans in general. When people ask me what they should grow if they're a first time gardener, my immediate response is grow green beans. There's something about it. They germinate so easily. They're so easy to take care of. It is so satisfying to like pick a crop of green beans and they grow pretty fast. They, they give you beans pretty quickly, um, but it's so satisfying to just like pick that and then take it inside and eat it for dinner. It's great. Um, the other type of bean, which I'm so pumped about are the dragon's tongue bush beans. This is one of those things where like, they're just cool. Like all these beans will turn green when you cook them, but these are just cool. And then the royal burgundy bush beans, which are the purple variety. I will be growing these as well. Um, and then I got these in a seed swap. They're called Empress beans. So I'm gonna try these out as well. I'm pretty sure these are bush beans, we'll see. And then the two different pole beans that we're gonna be growing are Dean's Purple and Black Creaseback or the Ideal Market. These are a, a green variety and not a purple variety. These two we will be direct sowing. Um, they can take a little bit of the heat. They don't really mind too much. Um, they don't produce as well in the heat, but if you're starting them in the heat, they, they don't mind as much. Um, so that's what's gonna be going in that front bed, but also on the trellises. So both of my arch trellises will be beans. Um, and these two, I felt pretty strongly about trying the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Um, I really like heirloom varieties in general, but having specialty heirloom seeds for the South is, I'm finding is more and more important because our weather is just really strange. So that takes care of the front bed. Now the other bed to, that we have to think about is where all my heirloom tomatoes are right now. I, I keep calling it the heirloom tomato bed. Um, probably need to find a better name for it. But that is 12 foot by three foot, so that is 36 square feet. Um, that will actually have some specialty kales. So that bed where all the tomatoes are right now is going to have lacinato or dinosaur kale. And then it will have this really cool purple moon kale. So that will be in half of the bed and the other half of that bed will be more lettuces. So the different types of lettuce that I listed out earlier is what I'm going to grow in the other half of that long bed. And then the other thing that I will be starting from seed are my flowers. I really, um, there was so much to plan for this year that I kind of um, forgot about my flowers. <laughs> And flowers are something that just make me really happy in the garden. They're just so bright and beautiful. And so I am apparently a noob and didn't know you could start zinnias inside. You don't want to start them too far in advance. You want them to be like pretty small when you transplant them, but it does give you a little bit of a head start so you can get blooms faster. So the zinnias that I will be growing and starting are the, are the meteor zinnia. And then this Persian carpet blend, I will be starting some of these. The Canary Bird Zinnia, which does not have a photo, but these are some of my favorites. And then the Fireball blend of Zinnias. All great fall colors. I didn't pick any of like the pinks or anything like that. Um, Bambino Marigolds. The Orange El Dorado Zinnias. And then I'm a little undecided on if I wanna do this one. These are the California Giant Zinnias. The only reason I'm hesitant is because I don't know what colors they are. The, it's a big mixture, so I could end up with like pink, which I don't really love for the fall, like the pink and the pale yellow, or I could end up with like these giant orange and red varieties. So I might save these for spring, but TBD. 
So my goal is to fill my entire border around my community plot. It's cinder blocks, um, which is a great border, by the way. Um, I haven't really had issues with it, like torching plants, root systems um, in the heat, which is something that I think a few people express concern about. Um, my goal is to have all of those filled with flowers when I transplant everything for fall, because that's something I didn't do this year. And it's just a little like sparse looking um to me there's definitely flowers growing but they're not as many as i would uh i would like to have growing so that takes care of what's gonna go where oh and my grow bags i'm growing broccoli in my grow bags, so more broccoli so that takes care of what is growing where that's how i plan it and I also just take what, whatever the recommendation is for things I'm starting from seed and that's how I plan how much to start from seed and then I add on whatever I'm giving away to like my family or whatever. <laughs> Once you have figured out where you want to put everything and how much of it you need, now we have to talk about when to plant it, if you're starting it from seed in like cell packs, um, and how that all works. So <laughs> this is going to be a lot. So the way I plan out when to start everything from seed is brassicas and dark leafy greens, you want to start eight weeks in advance. So we take the planting date of September 15th, we roll that back eight weeks, we end up around mid-July. Now I just go ahead and pick a weekend and that's seed starting weekend or, you know, if I have time to do it after work, I'll work on it after work, but plan in advance. So your dark leafy greens and your brassicas, whether that's cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, or broccoli, whatever that is for you, you want to start eight weeks in advance, okay? So what that means is for me, all of my collards, kale, broccoli, chard, that is what I'm starting. That's what I'll be starting mid-July, are kales, collards, and brassicas. Now, four weeks in advance of transplanting, so if we're still aiming for that mid-September transplant date for stuff that can still take the heat, um, I will be starting all of my flowers mid-August because we work four weeks backwards from that planting date. So I will be starting all of the flowers. The lettuce seed, the lettuces and the spinaches need to be transplanted once it start regularly below 85 degrees. Ideally below 80 degrees, but you're gonna wait a long time for that in Texas. So if we aim for about October 1st, we work four weeks back from that, and that means we start lettuce seed at the beginning of September-ish. So like Labor Day weekend-ish. Now the other thing we wanna start Labor Day weekend, which is that first weekend of September, are going to be the pole beans and the bush beans and we'll just direct seed those straight up so i will put a recap of all of these dates if you would like to follow along with me um and then once it's once you hit that temperature range of like 85 to 80 degrees consistently every day that's when we'll go in and direct seed all of our root vegetables carrots um the kohlrabi the beets. Um, it still needs to be warm for all that stuff to germinate, but that's when we will direct seed all of that is like right around end of September, beginning of October. Literally have all of this written down <laughs> in my planner. <laughs> so the reason I take you through all of this is because I think like as somebody who works full time and also likes to have a hobby of gardening and also likes to have a social life and also likes to cook and work out and do all of these things and, and go on vacation and like I have a life and I have things outside of gardening and YouTube and you know so if I can sit down for like three or four hours and come up with a game plan 
and write it all down so it's just there it's already planned out I just have to execute the thing usually when people get overwhelmed is when the thing has to be planned and also executed at the same time so if you sit down during like a calmer time right now it's freaking hot outside I don't want to be outside in the afternoon so I'm stuck inside so I might as well plan this when you take some time to actually sit down and strategically think about these things and plan it out, at that point all you have to do is execute the plan. I can execute the plan all day, but if I have to make the plan and then execute the plan in too tight of a time frame, that's when I get freaked out. So hopefully this was helpful to you guys. Um, I am going to uh, put in the description all of the dates I was talking about of my plan of when I'm gonna start things, when things are gonna get transplanted, just in case that helps you at all in your time frame, um, or maybe it's just at least, a, or maybe it's at least a good template to work off of um, to plan your garden. So thanks so much for watching, guys. This was a little bonus video. Um, I hope it was helpful. Um, I don't think that working full time and having a, a life outside of gardening is. A reason not to have your dream garden if you have some time to sit down and think and plan um, then really it's just about execution which if you're a gardener the execution part is usually the easiest part it's really the planning part that's the hard part so thanks so much for watching and we will see you next time